of the Vatican Museums to our little preparatory mood creating wine presentations before this great series of Art, Wine and Faith. It's a lot of fun that you're organizing something that touches on topics that are so dear to our hearts. Liz is an art historian, as I think you know. I'm a theologian by training and we both are certified sommeliers. So we're going to talk about things that we know a little bit about, things that we love and are passionate about, and things that we hope you are have the same kind of interest and passion that we do. Over the course of this five-part lecture series, these little videos are going to be a way to introduce you into the actual wines we'll be talking about in each lecture. So even though the lectures are more of an overview, understanding history and culture and faith, our role is to give you a little hint of something you might like to drink as you meditate on what you learn during the lectures. We'll give you along these five weeks also a little uh, introduction into wine appreciation, what it means to be able to, to focus on a wine, to look at it, to smell it, to taste it, and to draw out all the beauty that's there. But also its connections with the larger picture of art in these different areas around the world and as our faith tradition as Catholics. And mostly wine is a convivial activity. And so even though we're doing this virtually, it's a way for us to all feel drawn together, sharing a common experience of learning more about the role of this great work of human hands, which is wine plus the faith that anchors the church and the art and the culture and all of the other wonderful things that have spread around it. As you've seen from the program for the course, we're gonna to begin today with a lecture by my lovely wife on the history of wine, its creation, how it developed, and its origins. We're going to move on in the second week to the fascinating history of Burgundy wines and the, its connection with the Cistercian monks, with the Benedictines, how that all came about to give us the Burgundy we have today. In the third week, we're going to move on to Chateauneuf du Pape, the, the Pope's new castle or palace, and those beautiful wines in the southern Rhone region of France followed by my own lecture, which will be on the rise of American wines, and particularly the role that the Catholic Church and the Franciscan monks had to play in their development. And we're going to wind up with the pièce de résistance talking about wine and the Eucharist, and the wines that are actually used to become the blood of Christ in the Mass. Which you might describe as a timeless vintage. <laughs> Indeed, an eternal, eternal vintage. So before we get started with my lecture today, when I'll be talking to you about the history of wine and where it first comes from, where we find the oldest wine, we thought it would be fun to tell you that there are some wines from antiquity which are still circulating. And the first one I thought we might talk about is Prosecco, because perhaps with the ubiquity of Prosecco, how many times have we nibbled on potato chips, drinking a little bit of that sweet, that lovely bubbly wine, without realizing that it goes all the way back to Roman antiquity? Well, I think we should get right into that, and I'm going to talk about a red wine, another one that goes way, way back, which is called Alianico, and a particular version of that, which is called Taurasi. Alianico actually comes from the word Hellenico, meaning Hellenistic. It has its roots in ancient Greece. It's made its way over to, uh, to, uh, to the Magna Grecia in the south of Italy, where it's still produced today in Campania. So let's begin with the Prosecco. Yeah. 
Sure enough, look what I have in hand. <laughs> Here is a glass of Prosecco, which is to, which is a grape described or wine described by Pliny the Elder, who was writing back in the first century AD. And Pliny the Elder put together a lot of knowledge from the ancient world, from the world that he lived in, but even times before. And he actually dedicated a whole book on his natural histories to wine. And he mentions a, a wine called Prostitico, which we understand comes from the north. North, and this wine, experts believe, ended up being our Prosecco, made from the Glera grape, which you find in the region of northern, and you find in the area of northern Italy. And this wine was so good and so healthy that the wife of Augustus, Livia, claimed that it was the secret to her living to be 82 years old. A glass of Prosecco a day kept her doctor away. We're going to go on also to this red, very deep, very rich uh, grape called Alianico. This is the version of Taurasi made by Mastro Bernardino, which is one of the ones who really bought, uh, brought southern wines from the Campania region, of which Naples is the capital, onto the world market. They really became something very, very special, and that's only in the last 30 or 40 years. So these are great things, but the grape itself goes way, way back and is already referenced in ancient times. And we wanted to offer a, just a first look at how wine is approached. I'm sure many of you already know this, but it never hurts to run through the ABCs of, of wine appreciation. And the first thing we do with their wine is look at it. Their wine tasting, uh, an easy way to remember this is think of five S's. See, swirl, sniff, sip, and savor. And we're going to be doing that with all the wines, except in the case of a sparkling wine, you don't swirl it because you don't want to release the carbonation. Uh, but otherwise, we'll be doing this with all the wines we taste during the course. So we're going to do this, and each of us will give you a little, a little taste, if you will, of what it is that we're perceiving in our wines, that maybe you have something similar at home. So we're starting with, we'll start with this Prosecco, which is sort of the aperitif wine par excellence. It's something you have when you're getting ready to start your dinner. And one of the things you'll notice is this straw color with a little bit of green. And the little bit of green is an indication generally of a very young wine. And Prosecco is usually, it's only a few years old. You never want to age a Prosecco. And in the case of a sparkling wine, like the Prosecco, in this case we're going to be looking at the bubbles. And we see that in this case they aren't particularly particularly forceful. And that is one of the big differences between champagne, which everybody thinks bubbly in champagne, and Prosecco. Not only is it a difference in the grape, Prosecco is made from the Glera grape, but it's also a difference in the way that the wine is made. So instead of being uh, fermented, the second fermentation taking place in the bottle, as it does in champagne, resulting in these incredible amounts of atmospheric pressure, Prosecco is, is instead has its second fermentation inside of that, and it makes the bubbles much more um, sort of reduced and much more gentle. And so it's a it's a little bit more of a softer wine. When I look at my wine, what I see is a deep purple. It's a very very it's like a, like Homer used to say, with a wine dark sea, talking about these very very rich wines that are almost black. And Alianico is certainly that. Uh, and when we do the swirl, which we will do in this because it's a still wine, you see immediately with the legs that are formed that this is a wine that has a lot of glycerins, has a fair amount of alcohol, and, and a fair amount of sugar content. And that's what produces that thickness, that residue that we see on the side of the glass. For those of you who are not acquainted with the term legs, it refers to the way the wine drips back down the side of the glass. In English we say legs, in French they say larmes for tears. So they're different terms, but it's those little lines that run back down the side of the glass. The color here is between a purple and a garnet. It's starting to age a little bit. Taurasi wine spends at least a year and a half in oak, and so it picks up some of those wonderful, what they call tertiary uh, notes from its time in the wood. Um, and it also allows it to age much longer than it would if it were just immediately bottled. And as we smell the wines, and one of the reasons you do the swirl is to see its reaction to the side of the glass. Another is to uh, release the molecules so you can smell the wine much more easily and quickly. And we get immediately notes of spice, of plum, of blackberry, a, a great rich almost jammy, not quite jammy, uh, sort of bouquet. 
If you want to do something fun and open more than one bottle of wine, you might want to open a bottle of Prosecco and a bottle of Champagne and put them side by side. And even though maybe you don't spot the difference between the bubbles, you'll immediately spot the difference between the bouquet in the bouquet. Because Champagne spends a lot of time on its leaves, it creates a kind of yeasty smell. So one of the things you expect in Champagne is something that smells like bread or cake. But instead, the Glera grape and the method of making Prosecco makes it smell like fruit. So you have something very refreshing, light, fruity, a little bit floral, and again something that, 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 that goes very well with the lightest of little appetizers. Moving on now to our sip and then our savor. We're going to taste the wine, we're going to feel its, its aggressiveness or its gentleness, and we're going to give you our first impressions when we put this in the mouth. So we get to do this for five episodes, just drink. <laughs> Apparently, that's our job here. Well, this is very powerful. Uh, this, first of all, it's alcohol content. You can look at the bottle and see it's 14.5%. It's quite powerful that way. But you also know right away some of these strong elements like tannins. Uh, a lot of tannins, tannin is not something you really taste as much as you feel in your mouth. It gives a little bit of a roughness. It's an astringent, so you feel drying out your mouth. It's why if you drink a lot of a tannic wine, you'll wake up in the middle of the night and need a glass or two of water because it actually does dry you out. But this is lovely and it's mixed with um, these, these lovely glycerins and the fruitiness that comes through even on top of the alcohol. And, and the acidity also, which gives more backbone to it, is, is very pronounced. It is a great balance to it. Uh, it's crying out for some nice pairing with a, with a hard cheese or a steak, uh, but it's lovely. The Prosecco has a very sort of immediate effect of the bubbles that just wisp across your palate and then disappear. And so it's just a brief moment, a brief frisson, as it were, and it leaves a sort of pleasant fruity taste in the mouth. It's not, it's not a dry wine, it's not something that's acidic, it's something that just adds a very kind of pleasant little sensation, and that's why it's such a good aperitif wine, because it's really meant to open the appetite. It readies you for what you're going to have next, and it will go fine with mixed salamis, it will go fine with cheese. And what, one of the things that's a little special about Prosecco is that where champagne does not go well with things that are sweet, unless it's vinified sweet, but champagne generally as a rule, the dry champagne, the brut champagne doesn't go well with things that are, are, are sweet, whereas Prosecco does. That fruitiness stands up to quite a few more things than champagne does. So to wrap up, we will take one um, one more mouthful of this. Uh, don't be too, too jealous. Hopefully you have something you're able to have it at home. Because after all, the last S is to savor. And I hope you savor your wines that you'll be trying at home. But mostly, I hope that you savor the wonderful lectures you have in store by these wonderful team of experts, including you, coming up over the next five weeks. Cheers. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen and honored guests, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Wherever you happen to be in the world today, welcome. My name is Bruce Hemmingson, and I will be your moderator for today's lecture. Along with my wife, Gentina, we are privileged to be the sole Thailand representatives of the Asian patrons in the Vatican Museums, referred to simply as APAVM. Today's presentation will be recorded for future distribution to you all, so there's no need to be taking copious notes if you are ever tempted to do that. This lecture series entitled Faith, Art and Wine is brought to you by the APAVM, where we enjoy the tireless support, dedication and enthusiasm of our chairman, Mr. Ben Chang, and his wife, Kim. In advance, let me express our profound appreciation to Ben and Kim for making this lecture series possible. Okay, so today's presentation from Stimulant to sacrament, wine from antiquity to Christianity. We're embarking on a five-part lecture series that will culminate on December 18th. And what you will be doing with us is heading off on a thought-provoking journey into the history of wine and its links to religion. Wine lovers may not be aware of the debt of gratitude they might likely owe to past generations of Jews and Egyptians 
In the development of wine, where for over 8,000 years, wine has held an important place in both spiritual and religious rituals. In the 5th century AD, and just as the Roman Empire was collapsing in the West, monks began to plant vineyards to provide wine, not only for the Eucharist, but also for enjoyment with their meals. The monasteries of France progressively became centers of excellence for wine as the monks constantly honed their skills in viticulture, grafting grape vines and improving production in grape varieties. When friars and monks settled in the new world, they set about establishing vineyards first in Mexico and later in California. Today, sadly, few of the historical vineyards of the past still exist, but we can all be grateful for the rich heritage in wine making that we have all inherited. Today, please join us on a fascinating and enjoyable exploration of the great vineyards of the world in the very knowledgeable company of art historians and sommeliers. sommeliers. We will come to learn about the first known archaeological evidence of wine and its role in the commerce, literature, and art of the Mediterranean region. Then, through archaeological evidence, poetry, and art, we'll look at how Rome expanded and then drastically improved upon wine production with important innovations that still influence winemaking practices today. Today's lecture will then close by giving insights on the centrality of wine to the rise of Christianity as it went from being the start of the symposium to the very core of Christianity itself. So without further delay, allow me to welcome and introduce our very esteemed guest presenter, Dr. Elizabeth Lev. So let me talk a little bit about Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth Lev holds degrees in art history from the University of Chicago and the U University of Bologna, Italy. She has taught art history in Rome for almost 20 years at the John Cabot University, the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, and at present teaches at Duquesne University's Italian campus. Dr. Lev has been a fellow of Notre Dame University's De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture since 2015, and was awarded the Miser Visiting Fellowship in the fall of 2018. She is a licensed guide of Rome and the Vatican City State, and has served as a commissioner on the Rome Tourism Board and as a consultant on art and faith for the Vatican Museums. In this latter capacity, she wrote Vatican Treasures, the Via Pulcritin, Pulchritudinus, a film presented to Pope Benedict XVI, and also created a formational course for the Vatican Museum Guides. She, had led, she has led tours of the Vatican for over 20 years, showing world leaders, dignitaries, and celebrities, including people like Tom Hanks of Da Vinci Code fame, the wonders of the Eternal City. Dr. Lev's book, or books plural, should I say, include The Tigress of Forley, A Body for Glory and Roman Pilgrimage, written with George Vigel. Her latest book, How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, released in 2018, is now an Amazon Books bestseller. Dr. Lev also wrote and hosted Catholic Canvas, a 10-part television series on the art of the Vatican Museums, aired on EWTN. Her TED Talk, The Unheard Story Behind the Sistine Chapel, has garnered over 1.6 million views and can now be found on YouTube. Dr. Lev is married to Thomas Williams, who you've just seen in the video that uh, was presented prior to me coming onto screen. Uh, we're together, uh, they share three wonderful children, Claire, William, and Joshua. Aside from her mother tongue English, Dr. Lev is fluent in French and Italian and loves to cook. Along with her husband, they both became certified sommeliers in 2016, where I understand you need to be uncorking at least 40 bottles of wine a day to truly qualify. So I'd love to hear about that. Allow, allow me again to hand over the podium and once again, give a very warm welcome to Dr. Elizabeth Lev. Elizabeth, it's over to you. Thank you, Bruce. What, what an incredible introduction. I'm, I'm very, very flattered and honored. Um, and, and if I were opening 40 bottles a day, I don't think I'd be capable of doing this lecture. But I am going to be talking to you about the history of wine in, in really the Mediterranean region and how this, how this amazing substance goes from 
uh, uh, being something that we find a little archaeological evidence here and there to being the central part of Mediterranean culture. I, we see it all over the entire Mediterranean basin. So with no further ado, let us begin with From Stimulant to Sacrament, wine from antiquity to the dawn of Christianity. And in order to do this, I think in order for us to really enter into uh, the these lectures, all of the lectures on wine, I think it's important that we stop and talk about what is wine. Um, wine can actually be made from, from anything that's fermented. So it's an alcoholic drink that's made from the fermentation of fruits or plants, which means you can have, of course, plum wine. You can have cactus wine. You can even have myrtle wine. Whatever you like, if you can ferment it, you can make it into wine. But what we are going to be talking about over these next lectures is going to be the very, very special product that comes from particularly the grapes of the Vitis vinifera, which are found basically around the Mediterranean basin. For example, as you will hear later on in another um, in another lecture, the, the grapes that exist in for the, the territory of North America are not good for winemaking. But here around the Mediterranean basin, we have many, many, many varietals of what is known as the Vitis vinifera, and that is the grape that is destined for wine, whether it's red, white, or rosé. Now, the oldest evidence of wine comes from a kind of, I always find it a little ironic that uh, the oldest evidence for the making of wine was in, is in Iran. And in the 1960s, there was an, uh, ex uh, there was an archaeological ex um, excavation going on in uh, Firuz Tepe. And this woman, who was uh, Mary White, White, who was an archaeologist, found in the area of a kitchen, she was, she was um, excavating an area that was someone's house, she found in the area of a kitchen six nine millimeter stone jars. Here on the left, you see one of the stone jars. And inside these jars, there was a resin, there was some sort of something remaining on the bottom. And what happened in the 1960s that was such an innovation in archaeology, which is instead of just taking the jars, washing them, and then putting them on the shelf, they took the resin and they began to analyze what was in those jars to try to get a sense of a little bit more of understanding this culture. And what they found was tartaric acid. Now that's not very difficult. Tartaric acid is present in grapes. It's a perfectly, it is, it is, it is an essential part of what makes up the grape. As a matter of fact, tartaric acid is where we get the word tart. So tartaric acid means there were grapes, at least probably grapes. The thing that was interesting was to find that there was a resin from a terebinth tree. And the resin was in order to stop, in order to preserve the fermented grape juice, the addition, it's not something that happens in nature, the addition of the resin to the tartaric, to the, to the fermented grapes creates the blocking of any further fermentation. And that's what makes wine. Because if you leave the grapes to ferment, they will eventually ferment themselves into vinegar. But blocking the fermentation at a certain point is what creates wine. And as a matter of fact, that exact system is still used when you have, for example, uh, resina the retsina, the, the Greek wine, which still uses the exact same system of using a resin to stop the fermentation process. So this is where we get our oldest example of the of wine production, which is from 5400 BC, which means wine has been in the Mediterranean for quite some time. Interestingly, our first uh, literary reference, the first time we find people writing about wine, takes place in the Bible. It takes place in Genesis, which is the very, very, very first book of the Bible. So the Bible opens up with the creation of, of, of the sun and the moon and the vegetable life and man. And then we have Noah. And Noah, after he saves humanity with his ark, he then became a farmer in this famous picture, which is from the Sistine Chapel ceiling. It's actually the last of the cycle of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. You can see on the left-hand side, Noah, who becomes a farmer. Noah grew grapes and Noah invented wine. So the oldest literary reference we have is in Genesis, Genesis 9. 
where we discover that Noah invents wine. Then unfortunately he drank it and then he fell asleep naked in his barn. And what you see is the rather embarrassing story of Noah's sons finding him naked. But the fact is we find indeed the Old Testament is quite fascinated with wine. The Old Testament makes 247 references to alcohol. And of, of the 247, 40 are negative. So moments like this, when we have uh, we have a drunk Noah, but we find also uh, 145 that are extremely positive. And they talk about wine as a form of blessing. And this very, very lovely mosaic, which is from the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, shows the image of the priest Melchizedek, who in order to honor Abraham, who you see is the figure in white on the horse, you see Melchizedek who is offering bread and in the amphora below, you see wine. And so this offering, this idea of the offering of bread and wine, again, where do we find this already back in Genesis? We're now in Genesis 14. So wine has this sense of honor, has a sense of blessing. And one of the things I find most, most beautiful about this mosaic in particular, is that this mosaic in St. Mary Major is right next. It's the last of a long line of 22 mosaics. And it's the mosaic that comes right before you enter the space of the altar. So it's the very last one. And then you enter the space of the altar. And during the mass, during the, uh, 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 for many, many years since the church was built, the mass, the rite of the consecration during the mass in St. Mary Major would use the line like the bread and wine offered by your priest Melchizedek. And so the image was right there, right at the moment where you see the place where the bread and wine were consecrated into the Eucharist. I think it's a very, very interesting way of using the image to reinforce this transformative, uh, this transformation of the wine. But again, you'll be talking about that in your last lecture when there'll be much more of an emphasis on wine and the Eucharist. And then, of course, there's another example. This, they, they do have a lot of negative examples, and some of the negative examples are pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, this is Tintoretto's extremely beautiful image of Judith and Holofernes from the Book of Judith. And uh, the story, uh, this, which has been painted by Caravaggio, it's been done by Botticelli, Artemisia Gentileschi. This is a very, very, very famous story. But we always see Judith running around with the head of Holofernes, but we never hear about how Holofernes was undone. Whereas in the book of Judith in the Old Testament, Testament, we certainly hear that what happened was that he became overcome, that Holofernes, the Assyrian general who was going to kill all of Judith's people, she shows up with a bottle of wine and she gets him drunk. And so Holofernes, overcome with wine, falls down on the bed. She beheads him. You can see the head down here in the corner. And here you can see the, the wine glass, which undid him. And so really the stories of wine so between the negative stories, which are very few, the positive stories, which are, which are which are very many, and then 62 sort of funny stories that are a little bit more neutral, warning about sort of these people who are unjustly accused of being drunk. But the idea is there's always a question of temperance, always a question of this control uh, uh, and self-discipline that's important with wine. Well, the Greeks will pick that up. The Greeks are actually the people who be create a wine culture. They may not have invented wine, but the Greeks were the ones who invented a culture around wine. And as a matter of fact, a term which I think most of you have heard, symposium, is a term that makes many people think in terms of a whole bunch of professors giving papers on some topic that nobody could possibly be interested in, except for like three other professors. But the word symposium actually means drinking party. And the symposium is what you see here in this incredibly beautiful tomb from Pestum. It's called the Tomb of the Diver. And all around the outside and the interior of the sarcophagus, this is actually the sarcophagus in which a body was placed, you see a symposium taking place. So these are men who are reclining on their dining couches, the way that people ate in the ancient world was to recline on couches. And you see them holding their glasses of wine and playing their little pipes. And the idea was that wine allowed for 
wine allowed for easy conversation. It allows the conversation to flow. It brings a sort of imaginativeness and liveliness to the conversation. It lowers inhibitions. And so again, measuring between the correct amount so that we don't have an sort of overwhelming uh, uh, situation of a, of a, of a drunken um, a, a drunken party, but really just enough to make sure people feel like they can speak their mind and exchange ideas. But it was a very, very important part of Greek culture. And there was actually a whole method, there was a whole way in which the symposium was organized. Uh, it began with, um, the, the, began with the wine, which was kept in an amphora, which you see here. Amphora, by the way, means two ears. It means it means two ears. So it alludes to the kind of funny handles of the jug. So you bring in the wine, which is in an amphora. Wine in Greece, as you can imagine, it's very sunny in Greece. It's very hot. And that allows the grapes to take on a tremendous amount of sugar. They produce a lot of sugar, which we call which which results in a very high alcohol content. So it's absolutely essential that the wine be mixed with water. So you have next to it, we have a crater. A crater was there for the mixing of wine with water. And uh, at the end, it would be served in a kylix, which is actually where we get the word chalice. Um, the kylix was a um, the kylix was a um, uh, uh, a way to also control the amount that people drank. It's not an easy thing to, if you will, chug out of a kylix. And if you see back up in the painting of the um, of the of the symposium, you can see that these men are holding the kylix. You had to sort of bring it up to your mouth very carefully and make sure you didn't didn't slobber. Actually, I've heard or I've read of um, a trick, a joke form of kylix, where apparently they designed, this is in ancient Greece, so we're talking about you know, 500, 600 BC, they, decide, they designed a kylix, which had a little plug in it. And the plug could be pulled out by a string by the other person sitting at the, on the couch. And so when the person started drinking, the other person could pull out the plug and the wine poured all over them, which is just it's an interesting that people had these sort of gag gifts back in the um, sixth century BC. And so the Greeks were always very concerned also about the question of temperance. What's really interesting about the ancient world is the way that they are always trying to measure the, the fun of wine, the beauty of wine, the, the, the deliciousness of wine with the need to temper or to apply some sort of moderation to its consumption. And you know, we find all the way back in the Odyssey, and, 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 you, and you heard my husband saying, I love that line, the wine dark sea that Homer uses. But in uh, Homer's Odyssey, the way that Odysseus manages to undo the horrible Cyclops who's trapped he and his few and his and his shipmates in a cave and every single day he's reeling this huge stone in the front and he's eating little two by two all of his shipmates and finally uh, uh odysseus comes up with some of the greek wine unwatered greek wine they point out and he's and he and he he offers this unwatered, very, very, very strong Greek wine to Polyphemus. And when the Cyclops drinks the wine, which you can see him drinking here, uh, when the Cyclops drinks the wine and then finally passes out, uh, Odysseus and his men poke out his eye and manage to escape. And again, the idea is always that of reinforcing the importance of temperance in wine. As a matter of fact, there's a really remarkable piece of... Um, it's an ancient uh, poem by a man named Abelus, and it's uh, only a little teeny bit of this, this poem is left, but it says, it it's, it's imagines a dinner party in which the symposiarch uh, will be preparing the craters. Now, the symposiarch was basically the same thing as a uh, sommelier. And so the, the symposiarch's job was to be able to figure out how much wine to add to the water and then how much how many craters he should prepare in order to um, in order to have a perfect meal or to have a perfect event and he writes in this great poem for sensible men i prepare only three craters one is for health which they drink first the second for love and pleasure and the third for sleep after the third one is drained wise men go home. 
for the fourth one is no longer mine. The fourth is the one for shouting. The fifth is the one for arguments. The sixth is for bad behavior. The seventh for the breaking of furniture. The eighth for depression. Nine, ninth for madness. And so this is really a lining up of how a dinner party deteriorates very quickly when the situation gets out of control. And again, these images that are used very frequently in, uh, in these, in this is a this is an image of a crater, uh, a red figure vase, and um, it shows a menead. In particularly, the Greeks had a certain uh, uh, diffidence towards drunken women. And there were certain women who followed the god of wine. So we just saw the, the picture that Caravaggio painted of Bacchus in, in Latin and Dionysus. In Greek, the ultimate symposiarch and the god of wine. In the case of the, um, in the case of Dionysus in Greece, he had a group of female followers who are known as the Meneads. And the Meneads were given to ecstatic dance. They were, they were, they were, they were, they drank and they, they had these sort of frenzied experiences. This is actually a little bit important because the cult of Dionysus, the cult of wine, was one of the very, very, very few universal cults in the ancient world. The ancient world allowed, most religions were exclusive. In order to join the religion of Mithras, you had to be a man. In order to worship the Bonadea, you had to be a woman. There were a series of, usually there was some sort of exclusive factor for almost every religion in the ancient world. But the god of wine had a religion that was open to everybody. And the other thing about the religion of the god of wine is that it was a, it was a religion that offered a more personalized experience of the god. So as opposed to the Roman state religion where you, you know, burn a bit of pig down below and the smoke goes up to the gods in the heavens and there is really no contact or personal experience of the god. In the case of the cult of Dionysus, the idea was that, you know, between the, 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 the elevated sensation of drinking, uh, the drums that are almost always present in the in the Dionysiac rites, um, you would have an you would have an experience that would be ecstatic. It would be an out of body experience, and it would make you feel closer to the gods. These women who were de devotees of uh, Dionysus apparently overdid this experience, and they could become extremely dangerous. And actually, they tore people apart in the midst of their sort of ecstatic frenzies. Something interesting, but 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 it is important to remember remember that this was a religion that was open to everybody. There was actually the possibility of being part of this religion, no matter who you were. And that universality, I think, is a very interesting thing because the next religion that will show up on the landscape that will be that universal will be Christianity. And of course, Christianity is focused around its central sacrament of uh, the body and blood of Christ in the form of uh, bread and wine offered at the altar. Now, I have another thing to point out here. The god of wine is, um, is uh, represented by the Tirsus. So the God um, Dionysus um, carries a tirsus, and you see here the Menead is carrying her own tirsus, which is a staff covered by a pine cone. And that will probably remind you of um, your of something you know quite well in Rome, which is the pine cone in the courtyard of the pine cone. And we don't really know where it was found in the area near um, near the Pantheon. And people often discuss, you know, what does it mean? What's the meaning of this pine cone? But it is, it is very plausible that found in the area um, of the um, tomb, of, or found in the area around the Pantheon, uh, it probably was a site where there was some sort of devotion to the god Dionysus. So I just thought it'd be an interesting way to link up with that amazing Bramante courtyard, which is almost complete in its extraordinary restoration. And then I thought I'd throw in this picture simply because I really do love the artist Lawrence, Lawrence Alma Tadema. And uh, here you have uh, the women of Amphisa. And this is just a lovely story. This is actually an ancient Greek story. And it's a story of a group of women who come from Amphisa. And these women who you see lying on the ground are Meneats. And they're wearing around their heads these big old ivy um, 
these big old ivy crowns. And that was actually a way to ward off hangovers. You can actually find this written up in ancient sources that people would wear ivy crowns around their head because it would shade your temples and keep your head from getting too hot from the alcohol. So you see the women who have been off, these meneads, these, these women of Amphisa who are devotees of the god of wine. They've been drinking too much and they wander into the, into the market square of the, um, of the, of the, of the, of a nearby town and the women in this in this town they uh see these drunken women pass out and they stood guard all around them all night to keep the men from the town of the town from coming in and taking advantage of the drunken women so it's a really interesting story about you see the more temperate women standing in the outside with the more sober outfits they're kind of standing protectively over these women who are intemperate, who have passed out on the ground and the women on the left are actually offering them breakfast. I think it's just a very, very, very beautiful painting of female solidarity. And I just threw it in there simply because it's beautiful. Um, the Greeks actually, uh, they are the ones responsible for the creation of the wine culture in Italy. They, uh, when they first came to Italy, when they first developed Italy in Magna Grecia, they were the ones who first named the southern part of the Italian peninsula Onetria. And Onetria means the land of the tamed vines. So this was about, did they come to Italy, they see this really amazing type of um, uh, fertility for the for the production of wine. And so they named the, the named the Italian peninsula the land of the tamed vines. And they brought with them apparently some of their own varietals, of which one of which we believe is the Alianico. Alianico by many scholars appears to come from it's a it's a it's a transformation of the word Hellenistico. Hellenistic is what we is a word we used a word used for Greece. Elas is the word for Greece, and that this, this language, when it made its way over into the Italian peninsula and then eventually began to transform into the Italian dialects many, many years later, Elas or uh, Ellenistico became Alianico. And for that reason, the Alianico di Vultura comes from, uh, is a wine brought over probably in the sixth century from Greece. And you can see this wonderful area of Vulture, which is near Campania, which means it's also taking advantage of that very, very volcanic soil, which will be a game changer when wine uh, construction, when wine, wine production appears here in Italy. So, wine in Rome. The Romans, as they do, take, uh, take things that everybody else is doing and they make it better. Um, the Romans really had an exceptional uh, capacity of taking um, what people were already doing, whether it was making mosaics. Mosaic is a very, very ancient art form, but somehow by the time the Romans are through with mosaic making, no one can imagine a mosaic that doesn't look like a Roman mosaic. And it was very, very similar, the situation with the production of winemaking. Um, he was, the Romans, they are the ones who figured out several different things about producing wine. They wrote many, many, many tracks on uh, the production of wine. And I think perhaps um, the most important things that they developed was the uh, idea of the pigage, uh, the crushing of the grapes, and also the different pressings of the grapes. So they took the first wine. So when you first have the, the crushing of the grapes, which could either be done by foot, as you see in this cute little mosaic here, but it could also be done by, uh, by machines. So they found the remains of, um, of wine presses, actually, you know, machine wine presses that were uh, in Pompeii. And they've actually recreated them in Pompeii. So it's kind of interesting to go see. So so the Romans create wine presses. They make the distinction between the first press of the wine, the first juice that rolls free, which is going to be sweeter and purer from, for example, the third press, which because of the fact it'll be pressing so hard on the skins and on the seeds, it'll be very, very tannic. And they would put that aside and they would use that, for example, that was a wine that they would give to slaves. <clears throat> they are also the ones who realized that the Greeks who mostly let the grapes grow on the ground or sometimes might train a vine up around a tree. The Romans are the ones who began creating pergolas or sort of overhead uh, types of trellises for, for growing grapes. And so the grapes get lifted up off the ground. They get stretched out in such a way 
that they can receive more sun, they can wind and all these different elements that are part of really getting the most out of that, out of each one of the, the, the actual grapes. The Romans are the ones who began to understand the difference between vintages. They are the ones who began to serve wine in glass. So on the right hand side, you see, um, you see Roman wine glasses. So they really developed a storage. They worked on the question of storage, like how long you should keep wine, where you should keep wine. And so they really developed a very, very, very uh, uh, important culture around um, the making of, of wine. Um, they also are the ones who began to develop a different idea of what, uh, what a wine was worth. So this is a wine sign, which comes from uh, Pompeii. And this is uh, for one coin, you can drink wine. For two, you can drink the best. For four, you, you can drink Falernium. And so this is really, these are different, um, <clears throat> these are different price ranges for the different kinds of wine. You can see from this image though, that Romans preferred red white wine to red wine because there's only one uh, red wine here. <clears throat> The Romans actually preferred, they, they, had a, they had a tremendous fondness for white wine. Excuse me. <clears throat> and out of the white wine question comes one of the most interesting, some of the most interesting wines of all. <clears throat> Olivia Augusta, who is very, I think I mentioned this in the video, she only drank the wine of Puccino. This is what became Prosecco. And so we see our lovely picture of a woman who lived to be 82 years old drinking white wine. So I think that's a good plug for it. Of course, the Romans also like to make these very, very um, entertaining images of women who are drunk on wine. And so here you have sort of the alternate version, the woman who is sitting here clutching her wine glass, a wine, a, 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 a statue we have in the Capitoline Museums. And the explosion of Vesuvius, <coughs> I am very sorry. <clears throat> The explosion of Vesuvius created a very serious situation for winemaking when it took out some of the most important vineyards all around the area of Campania, which is where the best wines in the world were grown. The most famous wine in the world for Rome was a wine called Falernian wine. And Falernian wine was uh, a white wine probably made from a Yannico. So it's a very, very interesting idea of this, 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 <clears throat> this Falernium. Falernian wine was a wine that was produced in ancient Rome as far back as the second century BC. And I should also be able to, I should also tell you that wine showed up a little bit later in Roman culture. So with the Greeks, I've been showing you wine, wine bottles and wine stories that go back to 6th, 5th, 4th century BC. In Rome, it's a very different situation. Romans don't really get involved in the making of wine until the 3rd century BC. The reason being, or at least this is what some scholars believe, is that the Romans did not develop bread or a kind of a dry food culture until about the 3rd century BC. Before that, Romans ate mostly a kind of uh, soup made, made of legumes and uh, vegetables, which was very, it was very, it was wet food. And so the desire for wine wasn't very strong for the Romans, but the Romans start baking and producing bread in the third century. By the second century BC, the Romans have professional bakeries and are actually producing, people are eating bread normally. And that's when we see, it's exactly at that moment that we see the arrival of people drinking wine, drinking wine of wine production in ancient Rome. And so this, uh, this of these wines, the most famous of all of them is going to be this Falernian wine. Falernian wine was apparently a very, very high proof wine. So maybe 30 proof even vinified white and made very, very sweet. And I'm going to get back to why the sweet is very important um, in, uh, in a little bit. The story of how Falernian wine came into being was, um, was actually, it's a, it, it's, the Romans are so proud of it that they will actually say that it was a gift from the god of wine who met a very nice man in Campania, that Bacchus was um, 
traveling through Campania and he met this very kind man. And as a gift, when he left the next day, he left this, this vat of extremely wonderful wine. And then he covered the hills with all around Campania. So that's what you're looking at here. Um, <clears throat> covered the hills all around Campania with these, with these grapes. And a lot of people have speculated what made this Falernian wine so good that it was uh, the fir very first case of a Grand Cru vintage, the very first case in the history of, of wine, of there being a discussion of a vintage of wine <clears throat> that would be considered a Grand Cru, was, was something called the opinium vintage. So that would mean the opium, the op opinion in vintage, which means the very best <clears throat> of 120, 121 BC, which was served at a banquet in 60 BC in honor of Julius Caesar. So the very first time we hear about a vintage is of this Falernian wine, 121 BC, the opium vintage, which was given to Julius Caesar for a banquet to celebrate his conquests in Spain. So the, the, this wine becomes extremely uh, important. There is an idea that perhaps th this wine was also, um, since it grew along the slopes of um, these volcanic mountains, that uh, there's also the idea that part of what concentrated the sugar was that they picked the grapes late, perhaps at the early frost. So something like an ice wine, which also would have explained the very, very high alcohol content in this wine. At any rate, people were very, very excited about this wine with the one exception of Marcus Aurelius, who occasionally we need Marcus Aurelius to put things back in perspective. And he said, listen, Falernian wine is just juice from a bunch of grapes. So. Some people were not as impressed, but the Romans were really such um, such dramatic wine drinkers that uh, by the time the empire was underway, they were drinking about uh, 180 million liters annually. And that boils down to a bottle of wine each day for every citizen. So the Romans were tremendous, tremendous wine drinkers. And as a result, when the explosion of Vesuvius not only took out the vineyards of the Falernian region, but took out the vineyard, vineyards of this incredibly fertile area where the Romans had been growing most of their wine, in 79 AD, the Romans panicked so seriously that even in areas around Rome, so, you know, 100 miles away, in areas around Rome, they began to um, <clears throat> rip up the, um, the fields in which they were planting grain in order to plant uh, grapes. And so the, 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 the situation became so absurd that Emperor Domitian, who reigned from 82 to 96, had to actually tell the Romans to, to uproot their vineyards and go back to planting, planting, planting grain because there was a food supply shortage. Um, <clears throat> There was a food supply shortage in uh, in Rome, and of course, the Romans really they they loved to talk about wine. They loved to uh, write about wine, and of course, they loved to wax eloquently about wine. And perhaps the greatest of the uh, greatest of the writers about wine, although they all do, they everybody writes about wine. There are actually treatises written about wine. Um, Columnus writes uh, treatises about wine, and Cato the Elder wrote extensively about wine. But um, <clears throat> Horace, who is perhaps the uh, most charming of the Roman, but most, most elegant of the Roman poets, uh, is the one who gives us very beautiful discussions about wine in his poetry. And of course, that magnificent line, no poem was ever written by, by water drinkers. Um, and so the... Um, <clears throat> I think it's very funny when you're visiting the Vatican museums, uh, there comes a point when you're walking along the gallery of the candelabra, you can see in this picture in the, in the right hand, lower right hand corner, um, this is the gallery of the candelabra, candelabra, which as you're leaving the Belvedere Palace and you're heading down towards the Sistine Chapel, this is the first gallery you pass through. And in the center of the gallery, or right before the center of the gallery, there is a whole series of statues. All of them are all statues of the god of wine. And I always thought it was very um, clever on the part of the curators of the Vatican Museum 
that um, apparently they, they've noticed that the favorite god of the ancient world is the god of wine. And so you've got the baby god of wine here, that's Dionysus sitting on the shoulders of, um, <clears throat> sitting on the shoulders of, of um, <clears throat> the satyr Silenus. You have the god of wine standing here. You have another god of wine here. On the opposite side, you have a, you have a wine shop sign and you even have a menead. So really, I, I think it's a very nice way of bringing together and making it very evident that this uh, wine culture was extremely prevalent. And the Romans loved to tell stories about wine. So the whole concept of recounting histories of wine was very important to them. And so the most expensive glass of wine in history, the Romans had the most famous vintage. The Romans had uh, the most dramatic situation of losing wine during the um, during the explosion of Pompeii, and the most expensive glass of wine in history is the one that was uh, served by Cleopatra to Mark Anthony. This is a painting by Francesco Trevisani, which recalls or which, which evokes this extremely famous story told to us by Pliny the Elder, who at the end of the day is really one of our great sources for um, all things regarding the ancient world. With Pliny the Elder's natural histories, he manages to tell us everything about everything. So he's the one who tells us about Liv Livia living to be 82 on her Prosecco. He tells us about Anthony and Cleopatra and the most expensive glass of wine in history. He is also the man who gave us the phrase, a phrase that you perhaps know, which is in vino ver veritas, in wine there is truth. In vino veritas was actually coined by Pliny the Elder. Well, the most expensive glass of wine in history was uh, when Cleopatra as was first being courted by Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony used to throw really complicated, wealthy, over-the-top dinner parties for her in the style of the ancient Romans that we hear about. And Cleopatra never seemed to be terribly impressed, despite the fact that uh, Mark Anthony was always pouring money out uh, to impress her. And he finally asked her, you know, why, what, what do I, what does that, what do I have to do to get your attention? And she said, well, I can outspend you for a dinner party without even trying. And so he said, I don't think you can. I've been spending the most ridiculous amount, finding, sourcing the most, you know, exotic things imaginable. And she said, well, come over next week. I'll show you. So uh, he came over to the next week. He was anticipating, you know, dancing girls and sugar sculptures, and God knows what else, but he shows up and there was a relatively simple meal until the very end of the meal. And at the end of the meal brought out on a cushion were two perfect pearls and Cleopatra, being a royal member of the Ptolemy family, which traveled with Alexander the Great back in the third century, fourth century BC, had come into possession through the centuries of two perfect pearls. Pearls, by the way, in the Mediterranean world up until the Middle Ages were considered the most precious of jewelry, most precious of, 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 of jewelry objects, more, more so than gemstones. And so these two perfectly matched pearls. And the, uh, it, 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 she also brought out a little ewer filled with vinegar and a glass. And she took the vinegar, poured it into a glass, and then dropped the first pearl in it, dissolved it, and drank it. And then she was about to put the second pearl into the second glass of vinegar when Anthony, in order to save this beautiful pearl, he reached across and he declared her the winner. The most interesting part of this story is what happened to that second pearl, which was the stuff of legend and song. Um, the second pearl was actually uh, taken by Emperor Augustus. When Augustus defeated Anthony and Cleopatra at Actium in 28 BC, one of his prizes from the from 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 the from the from the victory was the other pearl and he brought it back and apparently he had the pearl turned into an earring which he used to um decorate the ears of the statue of venus which was another bit of his war booty but anyway so that falls under the heading of the most expensive glass of wine in history because the romans um, didn't really have the same kind of language of temperance that the Greeks did or that the Old Testament did. It's an interesting contrast in the two, in the three cultures. And when the Old Testament talks about wine a lot and it sees the very positive elements of wine, it also 
always balances its love of wine with the idea of self-discipline. The Greeks also understood this. It's Hercules who gets drunk and, 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 and does these ridiculous things. And that's why Hercules has to go and do these famous 12 labors that you've heard about. So the Greeks are always very concerned about the idea of temperance and moderation in wine. And the Romans, even though Horace will proclaim the importance of drinking wine in moderation, the Romans, as the empire continues, are are far, far, far less interested in moderation and much more interested in kind of the over to over the top experience of wine. And that leads us to one of the most interesting theories about what caused the fall of Rome, that a factor in the, what eventually brought about the decline of the Roman Empire was indeed its wine, but not any wine. There was the wine that was produced for the masses, the wine that was produced in these nice rustic uh, uh, areas, but there was a different kind of wine that was served to, <clears throat> there was a different kind of wine that was served to aristocrats and to emperors. The wine that would be uh, served to aristocrats and emperors was very specially flavored. The Romans customarily flavored wine. They weren't very good at, um, at, at phasing out the different types of acids. So as I told you at the beginning, tartaric acid is where we get the word tart. So sometimes wines would have so much tartaric acid that the Romans would add chalk or seawater in order to try to blunt its tartness. So the idea of mixing things with wine, whether it's honey or anything else, is a very common thing. Romans, they flavored their wines using external ingredients in order to try to fix imbalances in the uh, actual wine. But the aristocrats did something that went even further. They created a wine that was a kind of, it was called de frutum. And the idea was you would take wine and you would boil it down. So when you were preparing, when you're preparing wine, you would take a section of it and you would boil it down in a pot. And in Pliny, uh, in Columna, in many other sources, they say the best type to pot, the pot to use is a lead lined pot. So as you boiled it down this, this wine, you boiled it down first, you could boil it down to half, um, or you could boil it down to one third if you liked, but even so you're boiling it down in the lead lined pot and the lead will emit something as sweetness to that, to that, to that de fructum. So not only are you intensifying the, 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 the wine by, by boiling it down, but you're adding this kind of, it becomes syrupy. And part of the syrup comes from the lead that would have been inside the pot. And then that was given to the emperors. And these emperors who, Caligula, Nero, who are all known for drinking this kind of wine, this kind of baked wine, as it were, and all of them suffered not only from the craziness that we've heard about, but they also suffered from gout. Turns out gout is a symptom of lead poisoning. So the understanding is, or this belief is, it's a very, very interesting series of articles, very interesting debate between two, um, two, um, two historians and scientists. Um, the idea is that the consumption of this lead-laced wine is part of what made this, these emperors crazy, because again, another sign of um, another sign of uh, uh, lead poisoning is sort of mental instability. So it's just kind of an interesting uh, idea of how uh, the madness of these emperors can be attributed to, in fact, a wine that was uh, produced in a very dangerous and unhealthy fashion. And here we have uh, from the. Um, <clears throat> Uh, here we have from the uh, film Quo Vadis, the uh, image of Nero in his cups, as it were, as it were, drinking his wine. And Christianity really transformed all that. Christianity really brings wine in to the central part of its faith and sort of pulls together all of the aspect of the blessings, but also the idea of a celebration um, symposium, in the sense of convivium, bringing people together. So if the word church, ecclesia, means people brought together, one of the great ways to bring people together was always around these symposia or drinking parties. And so the church 
the, 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 the budding Christian church, the Christian Christianity uh, continued with this sense of wine as a blessing that we see continuously through the Old Testament. We see it also something that could translate very easily into a culture, the Mediterranean culture that had been so thoroughly, uh, 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 if you will, civilized by the Greeks that had been Hellenized by its contact with Magna Grecia. And it proposed an alternative to how to enjoy something good to the almost excessive way that the Romans would take something that was good and sort of becomes a subject of excess. And so the, the and again, you will hear more about this, the, these, these particular stories from the New Testament, one of the later presentations, but just this reminder to you uh, before we before you move on to this whole series of lectures that Jesus's first miracle is indeed making wine out of water and he does it at a public feast and so you have a group of people who are all gathered together they are uh, uh, celebrating a wedding which is you know the 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 uh, communal um, uh, occasion par excellence, which the result of that wedding is to have more people eventually, right? This is the beginning of what will hopefully become a new generation of a family. And in the midst of their celebrations, they run out of the great fuel for the celebration, which is the wine. And so this, and the, the way that both Mary and Jesus work together in this, even though it seems like when Mary says they have no wine and he says, woman, it's not my time, but still they have this wonderful way of they, they work together. Mary is the first one who notices, she brings it to the intention of Jesus. So we see this culture that will also become even more universal. So if we talked about the God of wine being, um, the God of wine Dionysus being a, being a religion that was open to everybody, in this first miracle, we really see this men and women being brought together in this very important miracle. I do love this painting. I, I have a, I have a I have a great fondness for this painting because I always like this sommelier over here in the corner. Uh, the sommelier is so enormous. I often figure, I, I think I know what happened to all the wine. They probably ran out because he drank it all. Um, and then this uh, wonderful image of um, Paolo Veronese, which is the feast in the house of Levi. And you have, uh, this is Matthew of the calling of St. Matthew. And so this is a man who starts out his life as a tax collector. He's an extremely wealthy man. He encounters Christ in his little tax house. He decides to follow Christ. And, um, he, um, and as he follows Christ, he throws a gigantic party. Basically, he's going to blow it as a blowout party. He's going to get rid of all of his stuff in one night. And he throws this immense power party for Jesus and his friends. And so I love this painting by Veronese, which shows kind of the, if you look over here on the right-hand side, you see the wine pouring very freely over here on the, on the left and on the right. And it is interesting to think about Jesus who really um, enjoyed wine uh, and to the point where he notices one day, or he points out one day, that when John the Baptist comes along and he's always fasting and he doesn't drink wine, people say he's a zealot and a, and a, and a, and a freak. He says, and here I am, the son of man, and, the, and I, I drink wine and I eat food, and people call me a glutton and a drunkard. So apparently some people are never happy. And this is just a beautiful way of understanding that Jesus's relationship with wine is sort of this, he takes this long history of culture, this way of um, uh, this, this, this long process that we see starting in 5,400 BC, when human beings first saw this, this amazing thing that the grapes did all by themselves and figured out how to control it. They figured out how to mm, pause the fermentation process so that they could have and preserve this wine. Then the culture that developed around it, the culture that the Greeks developed around it with its poetry, with its art, with the symposia, with the idea of really bringing people together as a way to exchange ideas around wine. Then from there, we get the Romans who add the technical aspects. The Romans are great technicians and they figure out how to store it and to sell it and to build it and, to, and how to make it, how to, how to produce more quantities and better vintages. And we bring all of these different, different threads together and it culminates in the arrival of Christianity when Christianity 
takes all of this and transforms it one last time into the sacrament, into the sacrament of the blood of Christ. And so it's really, it's like many, many, many things, I think, in the history of Christianity. You can see all these lines that are being traced through the ancient world, but they come to a hub and they really reach their fullest perfection once Christianity shines its lens upon them. And with that, I will conclude the opening lecture for our, for our series on uh, wine and faith. Dr. Lev, Liz, thank you so much for what has been an amazing and thought-provoking presentation. I, I hope that you are consuming some very good Prosecco at what I think is just after 11 a.m. in the morning in, in Rome. And really must thank you because I know that you have come off a flight overnight getting back to Italy. So um, it really has been an amazing presentation. And I'm sure that everybody has learned a great deal about wine and its history. And already um, we've received a number of questions. So if you wouldn't mind, if we can indulge you for a few more minutes, if uh, you wouldn't mind taking a, a few questions that have come in. Now, uh, not, not at all. I'm sorry. I am. <clears throat> I'm sorry about my voice. I seem to have picked something up on the flight home and uh, I've been, been uh, try I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking wine. I'm desperately drinking water, trying to get whatever this is out of my throat, but certainly. Well, hopefully not SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> I'm hoping not either. Okay. So um, the first it was actually not about your presentation. It was really about a very, very engaging video um, presented by you and your husband. And the question was, what was the grape um, from the Italian winemaker that was, that was being drunk in the first video? Well, of course, there would be two. There was the red and, and then, of course, the Prosecco. So I think the reference is probably to the red. And, and what was the grape? Who was the maker? Do we know? So the, the red wine that is in the first video, it's a Ayanico. And the Ayanico is, um, is the one about before. So that Ayanico is the name of the grape that grows in this area of Basilicata. The maker is Mastro Bernardino, who is a very important winemaker because of the fact that he uh, really, I think he just died a couple of years ago. He, he really, uh, uh, changed the face of uh, wines in Campania, which were for many, many, many years, the wines of Campania, Molise, Basilicata, this area in Southern Italy, where it's extremely fertile because of the volcanic region. They made very, very strong wines, but they weren't very good wines. They were just wines that were made basically to be cut with French wines to give a little bit more color and density to some of the lighter French wines. But Mastro Bernardino began to really vinify attentively this, um, this Ayanico as well as several other grapes. And he really created uh, uh, this, the, the Ayanico is a very, very stern grape. It needs, it needs time to age, but it's a very powerful, strong, really, really good wine. The other wine, the Prosecco is the Glera grape. And the Glera grape is, the, is from, it's the Vado Bidarione, I just can't pronounce this today. Um, and um, it's uh, up in the it's, it, the, the, it's a it's a northern grape. So we literally went from both ends of the uh, of the peninsula. And the Glera grape is the is the grape that is specific to Prosecco. So Prosecco is always made out of um, the Glera. Fantastic. I'm going to be a little bit naughty because this I'm, I'm going to dive in with one small question from me. Um, from the video, what was it that was hanging around your necks in your video? Is it an emergency supply of wine? I, I really <laughs> that is the testima. So the uh, great moment at the end of our sommelier course, our, our most exciting moment was when uh, we, um, we finished our exams. <laughs> we finished our exams and there was a celebration in uh in the um 
in the wonderful uh, Cavalieri Hilton, for those of you who know Rome, there was a celebration for all of us who had graduated in the class, and we were given our certificates, uh, and we were given our test of them. And so it's the little little silver chain with a little cup at the bottom, and test of them, a taste of wine, so that the sommelier can taste the wine with his own little cup before he serves it, or she serves it, to make sure that the... Um, uh, to make sure the wine is good before you give it to the guest. Great. Okay, well, the first question was from Huerling, obviously the second from me. The next question is, is from William, William Chang. Um, he's asking, apart from, from Christianity, what role did wine play in ancient and other religions? And, of course, I know it goes right back to the time of the Egyptians, but maybe you could elaborate. It's, well, actually, in, in, in Egypt, um, I don't know that it was so much a question of um, uh, religion in Egypt. Wine was more of a question of class. Uh, beer was for workers. Wine was for pharaohs and, and priests and scribes. It was a, sort of a differential between um, your status in uh, in uh, society. Uh, there are many religions that sort of formulated around wine. They're mostly ecstatic religions. The most organized, and I use the word organized very, very loosely, is the dionastic cult. Um, because that wine, that, 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 that cult at least had sufficient literature around it for us to understand. But by inference, we know that the religion of Attis uh, uses wine. And by um, uh, uh, there, it was it was it was a very it's, it was a very common factor for many religions not so much the roman state religion that was really the the roman state religion was about burnt sacrifice okay um this one probably is a little hard to answer quickly um but maybe you could give, just give us a few insights. What are some of the most iconic paintings, frescoes, sculptures, if any, that reference the role of wine in, in Christianity? Uh, there are really many, 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 many of them. Um, I think the greatest uh, number will start in the Renaissance. Uh, when so, for example, the one that I used is my is, is my my personal favorite. But the number of images of the wedding at Cana are 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 endless. Um, there are also even more uh, sort of very beautiful images specifically celebrating the chalice. So if you look at um, uh, late seventeenth, early eighteenth century. Um, uh, uh, late 17th century um, still life type paintings, you'll see the sort of this uh, grain and grape frame and then a stone niche and then inside it, there'll be a chalice. Those are very, very beautiful. Velasquez has a number of lovely images involving wine. The Bassano family from Venice were uh, exceptional at, at representing wine. We have a tapestry in the Vatican museums of the Supper de Meus, where you see um, the, the, the Jesus and the two uh, disciples, and then in the foreground there's wine chilling in a little in a little vat. I mean, it's, it's, we just we have we have we have used endless images of wine in uh, in in Christian art, and it's really it, 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 I think it's part of what made me so interested because the number of images is literally endless. Okay, um, look, that's great. Uh, another question is, um, why is Christianity so relaxed about the consumption of wine and alcohol while Islam, Islam is so anti-alcohol? Um, maybe th this is a question appropriate for other lectures, but perhaps you have some insights why the Christians are so relaxed and Islam and is, is not. So I can't speak to Islam, um, and so that's probably for another lecture. You may encounter someone who who is more more um, certain about that. But I will say uh, about Christianity is that Christianity does not fear um, 
uh, in, in moderation, wine is something that is a, a good thing. And so because wine can potentially become a bad thing, so too much wine and alcoholism and, and, and the various problems that can happen with too much wine, but because it has that potential of being overused or abused is not a reason to remove it. It's just a reason to be temperate. And so Christianity, which really um, uh, is, a, is a religion that, 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 that expresses self-discipline, which is it's about, the Christian religion is about uh, the human being who tries to conform himself uh, and herself in the image and likeness of God. It's not, there's not, not to be afraid of, of, of wine just because potentially one could drink too much, but that one, uh, with the help of Christ, learns to master and disciplines one, one's instincts. And I think that's really true of most everything that, that, that when we look at the natural world or the material world, um, uh, Christianity is, is, is it, it, it has a tremendous engagement with the, um, with the natural world around us. Okay, um, another one from William Chang. Um, we've heard the term wine, woman, and song in, in modern times, but what does the Bible say about drinking wine for pleasure and health? So um, the, uh, the, the Bible speaks uh, several, very, very frequently on, um, on the question of wine. Uh, they talk about, um, they talk about uh, drinking, oh, there's a great, ah, darn it. Um, Oh, there's a great line from the Talmud. I'm trying to remember it exactly. Uh, uh, something about, um, uh, I can't pull it up. There's, there's, there's a wonderful line about something, how, how up until a certain point, um, you, you're interested in, 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 in women after that go to wine. It was a very, sort of, sort of very cute little line, but the, the Bible actually speaks, as I think I said earlier, it speaks 207, 47 times about wine in various terms. And really, um, most of it, the bulk of it is, um, the bulk of the discussions on wine is really about the positive natures, the beneficial nature of wine. So it really, there's no shyness in the Old Testament and there's no shyness in Christianity regarding wine as something that's anything that, regarding wine, just the attention or the, or the warning to not abuse wine. Okay, now here's a tricky one for you at just after 11 a.m. Um, <coughs> Did the Dionysians mix hallucinogens into their wine? Uh, we don't know that. Um, we don't, we don't, they can inconveniently do not write anything down. Um, it's not impossible, although I would suggest, I would probably given the nature of uh, hallucinogens um, in um, to mushrooms, et cetera, um, I would, I would, tend to think that they would be consumed separately, um, not inside, not in the wine themselves. Also bearing in mind that the wine is extremely strong. So if we're talking about an unwatered wine, um, I'm not sure they need that much more uh, hallucinogen on top of what they are, um, what they're already consuming in a very, very strong unfortified wine. Okay. Um, this is more for the winemakers, and I can probably tell Angela with certainty no, um, but Angela Poe is asking, how long can wine keep? Is it still consumable after a decade or more? So, I, you know, I, that story I told you about the, um, the Falernian wine from 121, which they drank in 60 BC. I, I always, I, whenever I'm reading that story, I'm like, what was it like? I think a few years back, I had a 1966 uh, white burgundy, just a couple of years back, and then it sherified. Then it become a little bit more like sherry. It was actually completely drinkable. So this would be was the wine put down 1966, and it was probably <clears throat> 2016, um, and it was a wine that we had no idea was going to happen when they opened it. It's brought over by a by actually a very well known winemaker at a party we were doing, and um, it was. 
a wine that had become a kind of a, a almost like an ambery color, very, very deep, deep yellow. And it was a little bit sherified. So it tasted a little bit like sherry. Um, so some wines really can age, some, some wines can age very well. So the Ayanico wine, um, is a wine that really needs to age. So 10 years is, is easy for an Alianico. Um, some wines do not age well. So Prosecco should not age any more than a couple of years. Um, white wines, with the exception of the white burgundies, the, you'll be hearing your lecture on burgundy, I think, isn't that next? Um, the, um, the burgundy wines, the white wines, have tremendous aging power, kind of like champagne. Champagne is also a Chardonnay. Um, it's a blend, including Chardonnay. And um, champagne can actually, Dom Perignon is a wine that age, that can age. So those wines can, can age very well. Um, some of them, the other white wines, they do not do much longer. They do not well, do not well do not do well much longer than 10 years. Red wines, because of the tannins, um, often have the possibility of aging longer than whites, but there are some um, red wines that do not age well either. Okay, Liz, um, I think we have hung on to you long enough and it's probably time to wrap this up. So ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, but sadly, we've run out of time. Um, if we've not been able to answer all of your questions, we do apologize, but we'll try to get back to you and correspond directly with you to provide some feedback at a later time. Okay, um, so um, do please join us again next weekend on Saturday, 27th November at the same time for lecture number two in this fascinating series where we will have Mr. Jonathan Brito joining us to present on the captivating topic of St. Benedict and the blessings of Burgundy. Jonathan, who is a renowned um, consultant um, in plastic and craniofacial uh, reconstruction, um, will be regaling us with his significant knowledge on wine, which he picked up on his various journeys through Western Europe. Um, so Jonathan really promises to be a most engaging speaker. So do mark this event in your diary. And if possible, please also invite your friends to come along and join us. This series is free. So really all you're giving up is part of your day. Now, last of all, we really hope that you've enjoyed uh, this lecture series. And if you've not already joined APAVM, why not take a moment to click the QR code on the screen in front of you and take the time to enjoy uh, join in this amazing organization. As we all start to emerge from the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic, although perhaps Austria is speaking differently at the moment, now more than ever, the APAVM needs your involvement and direct financial support to keep the many previously planned activities moving forward. Your membership with APAVM, along with your own personal contribution and support, would be very much appreciated and would definitely mean a lot. Okay, so we have come to the end. So until we hopefully see you all again next Saturday at the same time, may the good Lord watch over you and keep you safe. And thank you very much for joining us.